Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, and today uh, on Speak Up, we have a special guest. It's a little bit out of the ordinary. We have uh, another media, uh, not a mogul, but a media outlet uh, <laughs> here in New Hampshire. And I'm, I'm very proud to introduce Steve McDonald with Granite Rock, and I want to welcome you to Kevin, the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've had some interesting discussion prior to ca uh, the camera being on and all, but uh, I wanted to just uh, get a little background for our viewers. Who are you, and, and what do you do? You're, you're, you're a blogger in this new media? What is this? Okay, uh, Steve McDonald, I live in Merrimack. I work at Amherst, full-time job, family, kids, house, wife. Uh, so blogging is my hobby. Uh, I got started in uh, about uh, around June of 2008. And uh, it, it's the beginning of the whole new media thing. And, and new media is basically this. It's, it's using the internet to produce or provide alternative sources of information. So at Granite Rock, for example, we primarily blog opinion pieces uh, about politics, culture, even sports or movies, but mostly politics and culture. You know, you got to mix it up a little. Uh, we do some audio. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done uh, talk shows, radio. Uh, Granite Rock had an actual radio program for a while, and we're working on re-engineering ourselves to have that come back. Right. And then video. So you, you give people several different kinds of media and you give it to them in a, in a mix and in a way that allows them to have different choices of not just what news, but how to view it or hear it or see it. Right. So you've basically put your spin on it. You're basically editorializing, mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, the, the liberal media or the corporate media or however you want to call it will have one spin, but then you'll look at the information and, uh, from your perspective and put that out there as well. Uh, it's, uh, you're like the local Rush Limbaugh blogger. <laughs> kind of something like that. Yeah, It's, yeah. it's definitely right-wing medium. We are a conservative blog site. It's conservative Republican, conservative Libertarian. Right. Um, we don't differentiate on party labels. We are basically centered on principles. So if we find a Democrat or a Republican, whoever it may be, that we find is outside our principles, we talk about their views versus our views and try to do it in a way that's amusing or entertaining. And you hold no prisoners. We don't. We don't take prisoners. We don't hold them. Uh, it's all about the principles. Uh, if you believe something that we feel is way out beyond the GOP platform or way out beyond common sense, then um, we're going to take you to the woodshed. So let's talk about rhinos. <laughs> <laughs> we have a feature yeah. called the Rhino of the Week, which will probably come back. Uh, Rick Olson, who's one of our uh, writers, he's the um, uh, president or the head of the London Dairy Fishing Game Club. Um, this guy knows guns, this guy knows hunting, this, he is, and he knows rhinos. And uh, for a while we had a rhino of the week feature, and uh, it really irritates them to call them out on their, their policies and their votes as compared to, say, the Republican platform, which is basically what we're measuring it against. Give us an idea. What, what is a rhino? What is a, what is a person who claims to be a Republican in name only uh, and, and, and falling against the principles? What, what are some of the examples that you can cite, maybe even in this year? Uh, well, Reagan always talked about the 80-20 rule. You know, if you're with the party 80% of the time, then you're pretty much good to go. Now, you can take that a lot of different ways. There's a lot of wiggle room there. But you get to a point where you're no longer talking about somebody who's there for the purpose of defending a specific set of principles. And you have to ask the question, did you run on those principles? Did you try to get elected on those principles? And did you then back off. There are other people who are simply Democrats who came up from Massachusetts or someplace else in New England, moved to New Hampshire, and were somewhat moderate as Democrats go and couldn't possibly run as a New Hampshire Democrat, so they decided to become a Republican. We've had a lot of examples of that. Tony DeFruscia was a pretty good example. 
Um, I was just going to say name names, but by all means, name names. Tony DeFrusia, um, uh, Bill Remick up in Coos County. Uh, there's, it, there's a list of 15 or 20 of them. They've been weeding out over the years, you know, as they've gotten less interested in, in the actual bipartisan, or not bipartisan, but partisanship that exists. As the left moves farther to the left, you begin to find that it's almost impossible for people to really come to agree on issues like abortion, right. um, um, school choice, uh, marriage. So you, you begin to ask questions. Where does the party stand? Are you running for the party or are you running for something else? And I often just say, look, if you're an independent, then run as one. If you don't think you can get elected as an independent, then are you being dishonest about where you stand and are you using the Republican Party in a county or a district where it's more Republican just to get yourself in Concord? What are some of the most interesting races that you're finding here in New Hampshire right now? Well, uh, I think they're all interesting this year just because of what happened in 2010. Uh, the Senate is probably the biggest pot of mystery because there's a lot of people who are retiring and served one term and, and, right. and left. So you've got a lot of, you've got some primaries. You have uh, people that um, you know, have been there a while, and some guys have come up to challenge some of these folks. And you know, you're going to look, you know, can we get this guy elected? Is it, you know, so there's really, you know, with 400 House seats and you know, the Senate and the Executive Council, it's almost impossible to have all those races tied down. I know that um, you know, Dan Dwyer in Merrimack has challenged Peter Bragdon. Um, there's an open Senate seat in District 1 which is way up north, I believe. So you've got two Republicans whose names escape me who will run against Democrats. So once again, every Senate race is probably right. a key race. I know up in the Laconia area, it's uh, Josh Youssef. Uh, Josh, against, yep. Against, yep. Uh, what's his name, uh, Bill Grimm, I think it is. I think it is Bill. Uh, and we've, we've come out for Josh. Uh, we think Josh is a great guy. Um, and he's right on He's real time. solid, you know. Uh, so we, we do, and that's another thing. We, we'll get involved in primaries as... What do you think about the Merrimack race? Do you support anybody in Merrimack? Well, it's a new district. It's never been this district before. We used to have um, Ray White, mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of split us up now, and we're part of a different district, so we really have a new situation. Peter Bragdon is running, again, as a sitting senator, but he's never had this district before in New mm -hmm. Hampshire, and uh, Merrimack's got a lot of Republicans in it. So uh, Dan Dwyer's a local guy. He's from Merrimack. Uh, he's done a lot of local work. He's been in service on our own town council. And uh, so people know who he is. So he has name recognition in town. And he's got a fire in his belly from what I understand. He does have a fire in his belly. I mean, he's really concerned that maybe Peter's been there long enough mm -hmm. that uh, even as Senate president, he's gotten a little bit too comfortable. Uh, and, you know, I haven't dug into enough to be able to say, you know, is he, is he too comfortable with the lobbyists? Is he too comfortable with just being a senator? Because when you're in Concord or in Washington, D.C., after a while you just develop this yeah. something that, you know, I, I notice being a House representative, you know, I'm, I'm just a freshman now, I'm a sophomore, but uh, I know a lot of things got killed in the Senate, and uh, we had uh, looked at uh, that race or at, at, at the, the Senate, uh, you know, with some jaundice eyes. I mean, what are you doing to all these bills? If, you, if, if we had the supermajority, why are they dining in the Senate? And, and who's running the show there? And that whole idea of being comfortable, uh, you know, it's, it's time, is it time for new blood? It might be, you know, and you always want to do that. And a lot of people have left, you know, so maybe you have an opportunity to get newer, new blood. Some of those folks were, were freshmen. They were one-termers. Right. Uh, and that may or may not be a product of the business-as-usual approach that happened when, when Peter Bragdon became the president of the Senate. Don't know a lot about what goes on there. I spend a lot of my time on the House side and a lot of my time nitpicking at the edges. So I'm not positive. But Senates, in my experience, are always more moderate. I, I think that you almost always encounter that situation. I don't know if it's just the nature of the body itself or maybe because of the number of independents in the state of New Hampshire that people feel like that the moderate position is the best way to get into office to make whatever changes they can. Does a moderate change anything? No, generally not. <laughs> exactly. No, generally being a moderate means that you either don't have a position or you don't want to have a position. You play it safe. That's why I like Josh Youssef because he has a fire in his belly. I think uh, Grimm's a nice guy, whatever, but, you know, it's moderate all the way. And you want somebody that's going to lead us in charge. And uh, I'm looking for that, that leadership in the Senate myself. Now, I wanted to switch gears with you a little bit. I, I got a request to look into something. I said on the redress of grievance committee, <clears throat> uh, Carol McKinney 
you know, gave me a quick little email. He said, listen, there's a pond being drained out in Hollis. And can you do something about that? And uh, so I wanted to bring attention to that. Hollis, New Hampshire, uh, DES, and uh, you had wrote an article about that. It was very timely, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Okay, it was a quick little snarky shot at the Department of Environmental Services with whom we have some history. Um, just for clarification, Carolyn McKinney is the chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of New Hampshire, and I serve on their board. So everybody knows, I know Carolyn, I talk to her all the time. I'm going to call her when I get done here. i got to talk to her about something else. But uh, as far as the Hollis thing goes, I got an email from Carolyn from somebody she knows who lives right near this reservoir that's no longer there. And it's been there for a long time. And Somebody said 100 years. It, I, I think it was a, a colonial dam. Okay. I think it goes back that far. Right. Uh, apparently, Hollis has had some issues with it. They, they tried to do some modifications to a culvert nearby. Uh, DES came in and said, when you modified the culvert, you modified the dam. Uh, it pretty much changed the environmental impact. And as far as I understand it, they needed them to do some things. They would have had to pay some fines. They would have had to remove 25 trees. They would have had to have inspections. And the cost, according to the selectmen of the town, they, they decided it was too much. There was going to cost the taxpayers too much money, given what DES had said. So my complaint wasn't so much that the selectmen did what they thought was best for the town. There's, uh, there's some debate about how much communication there was between DES and the town and how much between the town and the people who live there. Right. And so uh, the town ultimately said, listen, we want to be done with this, and they breached the dam. And then when they breached the dam, they drained the um, reservoir. So everything that was using the reservoir, including the citizens, basically no longer have this natural resource. Um, you know, my problem is, is what is it DES's business? I know that they have oversight over a lot of things in the state, but have they overstepped their bounds? Is there too much power in DES? DES gets most of their funding, if I'm not mistaken, from fines, fees, inspections, that kind of thing. They get a lot of their money. They don't even need to go to the legislature to get money. They are funded almost entirely through bureaucratic action. So now you've got a situation where you have an independent government bureaucracy it doesn't need the legislature to justify its funding and can go out and get all the money it wants by basically terrorizing local towns. I'm not saying they're terrorizing local towns or Hollis, but you have to ask that question. Here we have a bridge that's over 100 years old. Is it, should it be protected as a, a historical landmark? Is it, does it have some significant rights of its very own just for being there? I mean, was the, the reservoir a problem? I mean, what? So once they drained it, what was their, would they say, well, well, the basic consensus seems to be that, well, in most cases, when dealing with wetlands in the Department of Environmental Services, you're going to have a situation where they say, well, you have to replace the wetlands, or you have to move the wetlands, or you have to, you know, hose your garden over here, or whatever it is. And they just basically drained it. And my impression is, is that they think that the wildlife will just get over it, you know, and kind of adjust and adapt. And, okay. You know, it, it's, it's so interesting because in the development, I live in the Hollis Crossing area. We wanted to put in a dock in the Nashville River, which once we used to have a dock on mm -hmm. the Nashville River. And it, it seems like it's an act of Congress to reestablish a dock that was there. That's shoreline management. But there was already one there, and somebody mm -hmm. wrecked the dock. It floated down the river. OK, we want to put another one. No, you need a permit for that. Yeah, shoreline protection. Sure. So, well, that's just it. That, I mean, does shoreline protection exist to fund DES? Does it serve so important a purpose? that local communities who have waterfront property or who have reservoirs are so incompetent and in their, in their citizenship are so irresponsible that they can't manage this without an agency in Concord having basically unlimited oversight over everything they do. It's definitely something that has to be addressed. I think it should. Sure. People should look into it. Maybe there is a reason. Maybe it is necessary. Maybe it's too precious. But at this point, I don't think there is any serious legislative oversight of DES or its budget. Because if their budget was in danger because they were overstepping their bounds, right. they might you know, step back and say, all right, maybe we're being a little bit too aggressive here, or maybe we are, we're finding a bit too much for this. I know nationally there's, there's problems with wetlands and, and, and the lack thereof. But in New Hampshire, it seems as though we have an overabundance of wetlands. 
And I think that maybe some of our laws could be uh, modified a little bit. Uh, I'm not an expert, but you know, just You're saying. Right. I'm just observing. So if, if somebody wants to get involved or, or, or wants to read your blog, how do they find it? Well, graniterock.com, G-R-A-N-I-T-E-G-R-O-K, one word, dot com. Uh, they can, uh, we have a YouTube channel, Granite Rock, on YouTube. We have Twitter, Granite Rock, on Twitter. Uh, we try to keep it simple. You could email me, uh, Steve, at graniterock.com. You could email Skip, who is one of the founders of the website. S Skip Murphy. Skip, Skip Murphy, yep, Skip at graniterock.com. Uh, you can email me at nh.steve at yahoo.com. Uh, we try to be as accessible as we can. And, of course, please come and read and comment. Uh, that's really the meat and potatoes of what we're all about. Right. And so... And, and you, you did say Facebook. I, I Facebook, uh, yeah, Granite Rock's on Facebook too. I think it's uh, it's just Granite Rock. Excellent. Uh, where do you plan on going with this? Do you plan on getting more people to to blog on this, or become more of a resource to the state? How we we uh, well, as new media, we've always tried to stay a step ahead as far as the the kind of content that we offer. Uh, most of it's print. It's all electronic print, of course. Uh, we do a lot of video. We do a lot of interviews. Skip hustles all over the state to get to events to, to really record the entire thing for people who can't get to it so that they can see it. We, right. we try to live stream. We try to do interviews on site. Uh, we go out and do video interviews and then edit them, and not, not for content, but just cut them into sections so you can get the questions one at a time instead of having to sit through 45 minutes of an interview or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and then we try to do some audio. And uh, we're hoping to get back into doing Grok Talk, which was our weekly radio show, uh, doing some audio podcasts of uh, content just to try to mix things up. Because people like different things. Sometimes you want to take it with you on your iPod. Sometimes you want to watch it. Sometimes you want to read it. So we try to give you as many of these different options, and we try to get to as many different places as often as we can to get the political scene in New Hampshire as it is not presented by anybody else. Now, you don't editorialize the facts, just the wheat, right? We, we, we editorialize everything. Um, what I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't say that right. You don't weed out the facts, basically. No. You, you, you give us the facts and... and uh, we give you the facts as we understand them, right. as we've read them. Uh, sometimes the facts are incomplete when we get them. Um, like I said, with the intro thing with the dam. Right. You know, I obviously did, I'm not a paid reporter. I didn't call the town of Hollis and talk to the DPW guy. I didn't call the Department of Environmental Services. What I'm doing is I'm saying, I heard this. Here's my spin on it because, and it's, it's a little snarky, I guarantee you, uh, make it a little amusing, mm -hmm. but I want to start a conversation about it and let's do that. So sometimes that conversation leads to right to know requests. Sometimes it leads to interviews with people like the head of DES, which we've had happen in the past. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we take an issue to your board, redress or grievances. Have you taken one? We, uh, we bring up issues. I don't think anything's come to you yet, but right. we've definitely, I mean, we talked to Bill O'Brien. We talked to dozens of legislators that we know in both houses. Um, Have you covered the courts in, in our state at all? Not near enough. Not near not enough. Near enough. Um, I think that as we begin to make more connections with people that we're familiar with, people we've met, uh, executive counselors, people like that, it gets easier to, to really get the information that you need to begin to even approach that. At this right. point, you're pretty much just throwing things at a distance at, at an issue based on a principle. Um, and then that's about as far as you can go. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking about Granite Grok. And uh, I wanted people to know about it, you know, all 25 people that watch my show. <laughs> well, we do pretty good. And uh, we're always looking for help, not necessarily writing help, but uh, there's so many things that go on in a state with a legislature that has this many people in it. Are you a 501c3 or anything? No, no, no not yet. Uh, yeah. We are, we are, believe it or not, going to, um, we might go that way at some point. Right now it's just a bunch of guys, you know, yeah. and girls who are uh, throwing out their thoughts. And, uh, you know, we don't have a budget. We just, it's just us. And it's a matter of keeping the government in towns, everybody accountable. Definitely local, definitely statewide. And we do some national stuff because you can't right. get away from it. And it has an effect on local government, so we have to talk about it. Right. Well, Tip O'Neill said all, policy, all politics is local, though, right? So Eventually it gets down there. I wish yeah. it was all local. Then I would have less to write about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate everything you're doing, and I uh, wanted our people to know how to find you and to, to give you some more exposure because I appreciate what you do. And uh, we need more people like you. And uh, if uh, you want to be part of uh, Granite Rock or help in any way, you know, get in touch with Steve. 
And if you want to be part of uh, Speak Up by uh, getting your message out, uh, give me a call or, or email me at speakupnh at gmail.com or write me a letter at uh, 68 Bartimus Trail, Nashua, New Hampshire, 03063. Uh, until next week, I really appreciate you watching the show. And if you want to support us, contact us. All right? Until next week. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens, and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.